Well, good afternoon, everybody. Our topic today is white wine fermentation, and we'll talk about some of the general processes involved in uh, making white wine. It's important to remember, though, that grapes differ from year to year, so there's really no set production formula possible. So we'll look at some general processes and some options within those. The process of making wine, again, begins with a vision. The winemaker needs to know what he wants to make. He has to have some idea of what kind of wine his customers appreciate, and then he can base his uh, fermentation decisions on achieving that particular style. So what kind of wine are we making? What, uh, what style of wine do we want? Are we looking for a sweet wine with some res residual sugar in it? Do we want something with nice fruity flavors and aromas? Or do we want a more full-bodied, complex wine, maybe with buttery mouthfeel, similar to uh, Chardonnay? All of these uh, styles are based on the fermentation techniques that we use. So uh, another criteria is, what's the price point? Are we making a, a mass-produced jug wine? Or are we trying to produce a, a premium varietal type of wine? Our fermentation decisions are going to flow from these types of factors. Now, we've got to remember our options are limited. A lot of factors are fixed. The location of the vineyard, for example. Uh, the varietal that we've planted there. Those are givens. The soil that exists there, the climate, the terrain that we're dealing with, all of those are, are fixed factors. Now, in Sonoma County here, we've got a, a, a cooler growing region, and that's uh, well-suited for premium varietals. Things like Chardonnay and Sauvignon Blanc grow really well here. Um, in warmer regions, you'd see varietals like Chenin Blanc, French Columbard, and Grey Riesling. They're grown over in the Central Valley of California, where it's quite a bit warmer. Now, we don't have to grow all of the grapes ourselves. We can also obtain grapes from outside. A, a lot of uh, wineries will have long-term contracts with uh, vineyards, with grape growers. Uh, they'll pay them based on the number of tons of grapes received and also the, the content of those grapes, what their sugar content is, the uh, acid levels, pH level, and factors like that. Being able to have growers supplying with us with grapes gives us a lot more flexibility. So by purchasing grapes, we can get around some of those fixed factors that we're stuck with in our own property. Um, <clears throat> in order to really get the most out of our growers, though, we have to communicate with them. We want to exert more control over the things that they're doing so that we know it's going to suit our own wines. But by working with growers, uh, we can get around some of those fixed factors and, and concentrate on some of the things that are more variable, that are controllable, um, like irrigation and fertilization, for example. So we've got to consult with the growers and be specific about the things we want them to do. There's some critical cultural practices that can lead to big differences in style, and we want to make sure they're doing things correctly. Uh, this is often called farming for flavors. It involves some of the techniques we were talking about previously, like pruning the vines, leaf removal. Removing leaves is really important, for instance, for Sauvignon Blanc. Uh, what kind of trellis we're going to use. Uh, what kind of nutrients are we going to put in the soil? What kind of fertilization? And how are we going to harvest? Do we want the grapes to be hand harvested or machine harvested? These uh, cultural practices will make a big difference in our wines. For instance, if we're uh, maintaining an open, sunny canopy, we're going to get better fruity flavors. Um, we also get fruity flavors from uh, shallow, less fertile soil, putting less fertilizer into the ground, and uh, irrigating less. On the other hand, if we have a heavy, dense canopy with heavy, rich soil, and lots of fertilization, lots of irrigation, we're going to get grassy type flavors in our white wines, which are typically undesirable. So we want to avoid those uh, grassy flavors. Now here we can see, uh, this is a picture of the Benzinger 
Vineyard over in Sonoma, and uh, they're well known for farming for flavors, having some really specific techniques that they utilize. And uh, one of the partners <laughs> in a small uh, wine operation is uh, The Bachelor. If you remember Ben from The Bachelor, you can see him in the Benzinger uh, vineyard there. <laughs> so Now, after uh, we've gotten closer to the harvest, uh, we've got to start following the ripening. So the winemakers will be out in the fields again, testing the sugar levels, figuring out just what the bricks level is. As the sugars rise in the grape, so do some of those good things that we're looking for, like the aroma components. The total acid content will decrease during this time. In fact, the acid content at, uh, at harvest is about one-tenth of what it was back at Verasion a couple months before. Uh, what we're really hoping for is a long hang, hang time so that the, the grapes can kind of uh, acquire those better flavors and become less watery. We can see here a, a vineyard and uh, each separate plot is uh, designated and you can see they've been checking the, the bricks levels and total acid content of each little area. Uh, one thing we want to remember though is we can't leave them on the vine too long or uh, we won't get them in before the rains start and the quality starts to de diminish. So when it's finally time to harvest then, we'll typically harvest early in the morning. Now we want to make sure that the fruit is at its optimum. For white table wines, usually that means 21 to 23 degrees bricks. You know, we're going to sh check it for varietal aroma. We'll pop some grapes in our mouth, check for tartness, see if we can project ahead what that wine's going to be like. So we'll pick it at night or in the early morning when it's nice and cool because we don't want that fermentation to start in the field. Spoilage happens faster when temperatures are higher. So we're going to try to take care of the grapes, get them picked, and get them into the winery while it's still cool. So typically we'll, uh, we'll move the grapes into the winery um, if we're a big operation, we might have a gondola, maybe with seven tons of grapes on it that'll come into the winery, or we may load a truck with half-ton bins and load and unload it with a forklift. Uh, when it gets there, we want to weigh the grapes. So the grapes, if it's a truck, it'll have to go on a scale that might be embedded into the driveway. Or if it's half-ton bins, we can weigh them on, on floor scales. That's what we've got a picture of here. Get a good readout of how many pounds of grapes are on there. We also need to analyze the load. We've got to take a really good look at it, check for MOG, material other than grapes. You don't want any leaves in there or little insects and things like that. So we've got to check for that. Plus, we want to check the bricks levels, make sure that we're getting the quality of grapes that that we've arranged for. So we'll pull some samples for the lab. Now scales are a type of winery equipment that I'm going to have you guys working on for your projects. So one group will probably take a look at different types of scales suitable for a winery. So the next uh, operation then is we've got to unload the grapes. Um, they've got to go off into a receiving hopper and then get moved over to the destemmer crusher. Um, if we want to really be gentle with the grapes, we can use a forklift and just carry bins around and that will protect the grapes a little bit more. If we're a bigger operation, we might use a screw auger. This is a, a picture from a student group that went down to Chile and uh, the screw auger will take, carry the grapes into the destemmer crusher. Um, <clears throat> really delicate grapes might really even be sorted at this point. Uh, for instance, at Jordan, when they're making champagne, uh, at this stage, they'll manually pick out all the leaves and all the little things that might be in there. Trellis clips, staples, snails, unripe grapes. Uh, they'll go through a, port, a sorting process at that time. And then at other wineries, for instance, at Stone Street, um, the white wines, the white grapes will go straight to the press. They won't even go to the destemmer crusher. But in most cases, we'll send the grapes to the destemmer crusher. And there, the stems are removed by this little paddle arrangement here that takes the stems off the grapes and moves them out to the mouth of the crusher and, and onto the floor. 
the grapes themselves will pass through these holes and uh, go on to the crusher. And that's where the skins are broken. Uh, we just want to break the skins. We don't really want to crush the grapes uh, because we don't want to damage the seeds and, and stems and skins that are in there because that'll uh, add tannins to our, our juice. So what we're doing, we're breaking the skin, some juice is flowing out. Really what we get is this crushed fruit mixture and we call that must. It's a mixture of the fruit and the juice. At this point, we've got contact between the skins and the juice, so we're getting a little bit of what we call maceration, a little bit of skin contact. Uh, a little tiny bit of that is okay for white wines. It'll help extract some nutrients and some flavorants from the skins, but we want to keep that skin contact really, really short. So why do we crush? Well, one of the main reasons is to form that, that mixture uh, that we call must, and then that can be pumped around the winery in pipes. A lot easier to move it that way than any other method. We also, for white wines, we're getting rid of the stems so we don't get those tannic inputs from the stems, and we're getting some of those benefits. I just mentioned a little bit of increased flavor from the skin contact. Here's what a destemmer crusher looks like. The, the paddles are up in this cylinder and you can see the holes in the wall there so that the grapes can grow through and uh, they'll form into that must and we can pump it out of there. Now at this stage it's really important that we protect the quality of the juice. Uh, like I said we want to keep a really short period of skin contact because the more time that, that this stuff is um, exposed to the air there's more chance of spoilage happening. So we really want to uh, keep it cool, keep, uh, keep that must down around 50 or 60 degrees so that fermentation doesn't start and so that there's no microbial activity taking place. Sometimes some sulfur dioxide, some SO2 will be added at this point. Uh, we really only want to do that if it's necessary due to Maybe there's some disease on the crop, some mold on the crop that we want to get rid of, or if there's been a long delay in handling the must. So SO2, it will help uh, inhibit oxygen so we won't get any browning, which is a real negative for white wines. Uh, it'll reduce that spoilage and it will kill any wild yeast that were on the skins. Um, the bad news is it can uh, leave an off odor in the wines and a lot of people are allergic to the sulfur so that can be a real negative also. In fact uh, really since that shift to fruitier wine preferences back in the 70s um, that's really led to a, a minimizing of skin contact so we're going to keep that period really short. We're going to keep the must really cool and work with it really quickly. The next step is to move it on to the press. So we'll pump that must over to the press. Um, white wines get pressed before fermentation. It's the opposite for red white. Red wines, we, we wait until it's already fermented before we press the reds. Now we already have some free run juice from the crushing. We might even separate that with a juice separator or we'll, uh, we'll run it through the press. I'll talk about that in just a minute. But uh, the rest of the, the must then is, is pressed after crushing, uh, we've got about 80% juice, 16% skins, and 4% seeds. That's what we're going to call pomace, um, skins and seeds that have been removed, and ultimately we'll distribute that maybe out into the fields to, to help uh, improve the soil, spread it out in the vineyard. If, we're, uh, if we want to get a little bit more juice out, we can sometimes add pectic enzymes in order to release a little bit more juice and, and liberate some additional flavors there. So here's what an old press looks like, a, a basket press. Uh, you can see he puts the grapes in the top and then they'll put pressure on it and the juice will, uh, will come out down around the bottom. Uh, works great for really, really small wineries. Uh, what we'll see at larger wineries, there might be a continuous screw press, there's also horizontal presses. I'm not going to talk in any detail about those yet because some groups are going to be working on those pieces of equipment. That'll be part of your uh, project. 
But what happens is uh, we move the, uh, the must to the press equipment, and uh, what's really common a lot of the time are these bladder presses or membrane presses, where it's almost like a balloon inside a cylinder that's going to put pressure on the grapes, and it really kind of gently presses the grapes and gets that juice out of there. We load the press through a slit at the top, and then it's inverted, okay, it's turned upside down, and the free run juice will flow out the bottom. After that, we, uh, we can use these press cycles. We'll set the computer, and the press will happen for a period of time, and then it'll stop, take a rest, and then press it a little bit harder. Um, what's going on inside, again, is just like a balloon pressing those grapes against the wall. And each press cycle, we can add a little bit more pressure. The good news is uh, it gets the juice out of there really quickly, and we've done it fairly gently. We're not tearing up the skins like uh, with some other types of presses. So we get fairly low pressure over a large area and get that juice out of there really quickly. Um, so it's handled gently and minimizes the solids. So here's what a bladder press would look like, and then a larger winery might have a whole series of presses that are ready to go into action. After the, uh, after the pressing, the juice goes to the settling tank. Uh, that's where we're going to clarify the juice. Uh, that'll help us maintain those fruity flavors. Some of the little suspended solids and bits of skins and things that are in there at this point can uh, mask the fruity flavors that we want to come through, so we're going to get rid of them. Um, <clears throat> we typically settle each of these uh, types of juice separately. The free run juice will be settled and worked with separate from the first press run, and then even the, the last press run a lot of time um, is used. It's still got some value, but you don't want it in your good wine. In fact, a lot of time they'll make what they call grappa, out of that last press run, which is uh, kind of a, 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 <laughs> a tough wine to drink, if you don't mind me saying so. Uh, but a lot of times they'll have grappa in the, the harvest celebrations right after the harvest. Um, <clears throat> so at this point, the juice contains some suspended fruit solids, you know, just from the skins and stem fragments. We're going to let them settle out in these settling tanks. It can take a as short as 12 hours up to two or three days for the settling to occur. And then uh, those uh, suspended solids will float down to the bottom and uh, we'll dispose of them. The good juice up on the top, we're going to pump it off. They call it racking it off and uh, we'll move it over to the fermentation tank. So after pressing and before we start fermenting the wine, we want to make sure we've got it right. Um, if there's a, we want to make sure no microbial action takes place and no spoilage. Now a little earlier, if we desired to, we used a little SO2 in order to make sure that happens. So if we're going to use it, we usually use it uh, during the crushing so that there's time for it to work before um, we go into fermentation. But it's really preferable to keep the wine very cool, try to chill it down to maybe 50 degrees, so that that spoilage won't take place. Um, if there's a good level of acidity, that can also help to limit the spoilage. So we want to look at the juice. We want the total acidity to be between 5.5 and 8.5. Uh, the whites would really be at the higher end of that uh, range, up closer to the 8.5. We want the pH level to be 3.1 to 3.4. We may need to adjust the nitrogen. The yeast need nitrogen as food to keep themselves going so they can do their job. So sometimes a little diammonium phosphate can be added to tweak up that nitrogen level, make sure the yeast will survive. Um, if there's not enough sugar to obtain the style that we want, uh, we really can't add sugar in California, but what you can do is add juice from a, a sweeter group of wine. We can add that in, and that will give us more of the sweetness that we want. Um, in other parts of the world, um, the process called chaptalization can take place where they actually just add the sugar. We also can do a little blending at this point. Uh, we can add back maybe the juice from the first press run to that free run juice and uh, use that to make our wine. Usually the stuff from the first press run is pretty good. 
Once we've got it just right, then we're going to add the yeast. So this is a smaller batch taking place <laughs> at a smaller winery, um, but we can add the yeast and uh, that will get the fermentation process going. Uh, the choice of yeast is a really important decision, and again, that'll be the topic of one of your projects. So this is where fermentation begins. <clears throat> the, uh, the white wines will always uh, be fermented in a tank with a closed top. That will allow us to keep out all the air and all the contaminants. On the other end, red wines will typically uh, be fermented in an open top so that they can uh, do punch downs and, and pump overs. So we inoculate the juice with cultured yeast and the yeast does the work. It changes glucose to alcohol and carbon dioxide. What we'll see usually is, uh, and here's a really large winery. This was also down in Chile. They got a whole tank farm. Um, again, the specific equipment we're gonna utilize will be the topic of a project that one or two groups we'll be working on. So whites ferment at a fairly cool temperature, uh, 55 to 70 degrees. That helps protect uh, the fruit flavors and the aromatics. If the temperature goes up over like 85 degrees, uh, that juice will blow off the esters and, and will lose the, the fruitiness that we're looking for. So in order to keep that temperature down, a lot of time we'll have a cooling jacket you can see the, uh, the dimpled area around that tank, and we can run glycol through there and keep the, uh, the temperature of the fermenting juice as low as possible. So uh, <clears throat> cooling jackets would be most important in uh, fermenting white wines. So as the fermentation is taking place, as the yeast is doing its work, um, the winemakers will kind of follow the fermentation. They'll use a hydrometer to measure the density of the juice, and that's actually going to kind of tell us how much sugar is left, how much, what the bricks level is. Uh, white wines will ferment for two weeks up to six weeks. Um, we can let the yeast keep working until they've used up all the sugar, all right, letting that juice go dry, as we might say. Or if we want to maintain some residual sweetness, we, we might intentionally stop the fermentation. Um, <clears throat> in order to stop the fermentation intentionally, well, one thing that'll stop it is when the sugar is gone, or we can reduce the temperature. Uh, we can take the, we can do deep chilling, take that temperature all the way down to 25 degrees Fahrenheit while there's still some sugar left in the juice and stop the fermentation that way, or we can uh, filter out the yeast so that they won't be in there to continue converting sugar to, carb to uh, alcohol anymore. Uh, sometimes we'll use a centrifuge to do that. So by stopping the fermentation early, we leave some residual sugar in there. That'll give us some sweetness in the wines that we're producing. Sometimes fermentation will stop unintentionally. We call that a stuck fermentation. Uh, that might be because the yeast cells uh, were killed, maybe too much sulfur, was uh, used on the batch. Uh, there are some natural inhibitors that, that will uh, hurt the yeast, or if temperatures got too high, the yeast might die and no longer be able to continue the fermentation. Um, a famous stuck fermentation was white Zinfandel, where some red grapes were being fermented. The, uh, the fermentation stopped, and the winemaker, instead of trying to restart it, just pumped off the wine and said, hey, this is kind of a nice sweet wine. <laughs> I'll go ahead and sell it. And that's how White Zinfandel came to be. Now one of the most popular wines out there. So when fermentation has been completed, uh, what we're gonna do with most of the wine is rack it off to a clean tank and start working with it, trying to get rid of the lees, which at this point would be dead yeast. Um, or, uh, in Burgundy, it's very traditional to leave the, the wine on the lees, leave it on the dead yeast. What they'll do is they'll, they'll pour it off into barrels and uh, let it sit on the lees for three to six months. That'll add a nice fruity element and uh, kind of add a, 
a, a yeasty character similar to champagne. So it just gives you more flavor and complexity and body. What we see here is a man stirring the lees up. There's a, a glass end on the barrel there, and, and you can see he's mixing it up so that there'll be more contact between the yeast and the wine. Most whites, though, are finished fermenting um, at this point, but some will go through what we call malolactic fermentation. That's a secondary fermentation um, that takes place because uh, some ba bacteria achieve that fermentation. They'll convert the malic acid to lactic acid. Lactic acid is similar to milk. It'll give a, your wine a more buttery, smoother sort of a feel. Um, it'll be less fruity, but have a more complex bouquet. And uh, once that malolactic fermentation has taken place, we'll have more microbial stability. In fact, malolactic fermentation takes place naturally, but we don't want it to happen just naturally. We want to control it, so we'll inoculate it with bacteria, and we'll kind of follow that process as it takes place. One thing we don't want to have happen is for the malolactic fermentation to happen in the bottle, because then it's going to spoil the wine, can turn it right into vinegar, and uh, we'll have problems. That being said, malolactic fermentation, you'll usually see it only with Chardonnay and with red wines. As far as the white goes, primarily uh, used for Chardonnay. Okay, so after fermentation is completed, um, we need to clarify the wine again. When fermentation was finished, we've got this kind of cloudy, yeasty, unstable, bitter material that, that won't survive storage. It's kind of unstable. Um, so we need to clean it up. So what we'll do, we'll get it in a tank, and uh, we can use racking again, where we'll let all these things uh, settle down to the bottom of the tank, and then we'll pump it off. We'll rack it off to another tank. Uh, that's a little bit slow, though. Uh, we might desire to use a centrifuge, which would be a little faster, or we can uh, use filtering to uh, clarify the white wine. Again, filtering is a whole subject of its own, and I'm going to have a group working on that presentation. Basically, with filters, though, we're just forcing the material through a medium that tracks particles. Another thing we can do to clarify the wine is uh, called fining. That's where we add an element that we later remove. Uh, a lot of the time, uh, egg whites will be added to the wine in order to reduce the astringency. So the, the things that we don't want in the wine will adhere to the egg whites, sink down to the bottom, and we can rack it off. Uh, gelatin also reduces astringency. A material called bentonite uh, removes some proteins from the wines. It's got a lot of sharp edges, the proteins adhere to it, and again, everything sinks down to the bottom. Another material that's used uh, periodically is PVPP. That helps to remove brown pigments if the wine is oxidized a little bit. Uh, PVPP stands for polyvinyl polypyrrolidone. Here's a picture of uh, some wine that's been fined with bentonite. You can see it's a lot clearer than the wine that was not fined with bentonite. So that is a good example of this clarification process we're using. After we've gotten it clarified, uh, we need to make sure the wine is stable. We don't want anything bad to happen to the wine after we've bottled it. So we want to make sure we've got heat stability. What, what will happen when the wine is heated, maybe during transportation to a distribution center, um, it will become cloudy because of these proteins. So by fining it with bentonite, proteins